in the Northwest Territories, in Yellowknife, one of Canada's most northern settlements. Originally, it was a tent town, a jumping off place for prospectors and trappers. Most gave no thought to settling down, making a permanent home on these subarctic rocks. But through the boom years and the bad, some stayed on. And 10 years ago, on a sandy plateau two miles from the rock, they laid out an entirely new settlement, a town of paved streets and cement sidewalks with a municipal water system, electricity and telephones. A town built to last near the edge of the Arctic barrens. They took a chance when they built the new town. Would people stay here to bring up their children and live a normal life? Streets of tidy homes with lawns and gardens now give part of the answer. A huge new high school opening this year is badly needed today for the children of Yellowknife. A system of heating all domestic water to keep it flowing during the Arctic winter overcame many difficulties. In the summer or fall, on a casual stroll through the streets, it looks much like any other town of 3,000 people anywhere in Canada. Twenty-one years ago, there were no buildings in Yellowknife. People lived the year-round in tents, and everyone was a prospector. There was a boom in mining and depression in the provinces, and the bush pilots had finally established the aircraft as dependable transport. In 1938, there was more air freight carried north from Edmonton than was lifted in the whole of the United States. Larger freight had to come in by tractor trains in the winter. They had to contend with extreme cold and blizzards and the cracking and humping of the ice on the lake. Many men came from the Peace River country in boats built by themselves. They were followed by the first of the stern wheelers. The first claims gradually became mines. And the greenhorns and tenderfeet, the farmers, accountants and clerks became prospectors and miners and grew to like the free and easy life of the North. In the old town on Yellowknife Rock, the past is still alive and life continues much as it was when the first wives arrived in the town. timers prefer to stay here, closer to the easy-going frontier life they'd come north to find in the first place. Here are still the trappers and prospectors, and the talk is still of exploration and gold strikes and new finds in the wilderness. decision had to be reached. Where was it going from here? Town Councillor Ted Williams was involved in that decision. After the war, when the second boom started, it was found that the old town became inadequate to handle the business, and there was not the, the terrain there is not very good for residential purposes, and it was decided by the government to plan and build a new town which is the present town site of Yellowknife. Today, 
day you still have to make part of the trip into Yellowknife by air, but by a regular airline and to a modern airport. And down at the old waterfront under the rock, the Fokers, Fairchilds, and Moths have been replaced by beavers and otters. Modern planes and in greater numbers than before because Yellowknife has remained the flying center for an expanding northern district. At the docks on the other side of the rock, barge freight arrives from Fort McMurray after an 18-mile portage down the Athabasca and a dangerous tow across the open lake. Sometimes the barges piggyback truckloads from Hay River on the other side of the lake, the end of the highway from Grimshaw, Alberta, almost 600 miles to the south. Oil, however, comes in from the north, from Norman Wells on the Mackenzie. The manager of the transportation company, George Ingalls, tells us of some of the problems of running a northern supply operation. There are several uh, which are quite important and which, over which we have no control. You have good equipment and you might have a, a dry season outside or a, a, a winter with very little snowfall and the water in the Athabasca River gets very low and uh, it's a shallow river anyway and you get a multitude of, uh, of sandbars which hold up uh, the boats and the barges. The uh, season on an average into Yellowknife is, is I would say the 12th to the 15th of June when the first barge comes in and the last one goes out the 15th. That gives you uh, about three and a half months, not much more. And uh, when the barges come in, uh, we, we take no cognizance of, uh, of uh, eight to five or anything like that. We just unload them. And uh, sometimes it's midnight, sometimes it's two o'clock in the morning. And uh, Saturday afternoons and Sundays, they just don't mean anything to us. Uh, uh, there's just so many days and all days are alike when it comes to unloading the cargo. One man who believed in the growth of Yellowknife from the start was Martin Bodie. Danish by birth, he came here 20 years ago with the single intention of starting a market garden. It took him 10 days to find this draw between the rocks, and he's been gardening commercially here ever since. The fact that he was the first to try this didn't bother him. His only concern was would there be a market for his produce, and there was. The season is short, but the summer days are long. Martin Bodie is one of the few who came north because of the climate, because he liked gardening and he liked water. But for most, the mines are the center of existence, the only reason for the town. The big ones are consolidated mining and smelting, and the giant yellow nut. Together they produce annually about eight and a half million dollars worth of gold and employ about 600 men, earning well over two million dollars in wages. Murray Pickard, manager of the giant, tells us some of the changes he's seen in the town since he first came. Uh, in those days it was quite common for a woman who had a bathtub and running water to invite uh, the wives of the less for fortunate men uh, over to a bathtub party at least once a week so that they could uh, clean up. Uh, I think conditions have uh, improved markedly along this line. Where do the workers come from? Uh, up, I would say approximately half of our, of our labor force uh, is uh, made up of uh, people who have come to Canada in the past uh, 10 years. 
Few Europeans coming north would think to bring their soccer boots, but five teams play in a hard-fought league on this clay pitch. Many learn baseball here for the first time, and in the winter, hockey and curling. Many come expecting isolation and fall easily into the Yellow Knifer's full acceptance of air travel. There are two full-time travel agents in town, and the people are used to going anywhere on the continent for their holidays. Many came for only a couple of years' work. Others have always been here. Native Canadian or immigrant, in one sense they are all new citizens. They are members of a town which has only been incorporated for four years. The mayor this year is Ted Horton. Uh, I am, however, the only the fourth mayor that Yellowknife has ever had, even though we celebrated our 21st birthday this summer in 1958. Because before we had a mayor, the town was governed by an administrative council, a good many members of whom were appointed. And it was only within the last six years that we obtained the privilege and the responsibility of having a fully elected town council in Yellowknife. As Canada expands north, many new towns are expected to appear. The physical problems of building and servicing can be met, but the question most often asked is, what will the life be like? Yellowknife gives us something of the answer. <laughs> 